Okay, I think we can get started now. <clears throat> All right, so uh, let's um, have an overlook of the uh, agenda for today. An overview. So um, today we will um, carry on working with the uh, Mesgrove system. So again, this is a major uh, um, program exercise to show you what it feels like to write um, a fairly uh, complex um, piece of um, code of plugin uh, for uh, Grasshopper, and um, and then uh, how to uh, apply certain optimization technique that is useful for um, geometric uh, design. Um, so we're gonna. So the um, main theme is to do the mesh grow, but from that we can learn a little bit about computational complexity. Uh, so like how 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 much time um, the overall um, algorithm will take to run as you uh, have more uh, data in your system. Like by data, and by data in this case we mean like how many vertices or or how large the the mesh is. Uh, and then we're gonna learn about spatial data structure. So this is uh, where um, uh, there are certain kind of algorithm that we can use to really optimize uh, the um, sphere collisions in our mesh system. And we're going to use a, um, a particular spatial data structure uh, algorithm called R3, which comes with Rhino Common. Uh, we're going to use that um, to speed up the um, the sphere-sphere uh, collision detections. Um, and then finally, um, we're going to see how, after we uh, have our Mesgrove system, work as a plugin and um, expose that plugin as a visual grasshopper component. Um, we, I will show you how to we, we can use uh, the Mesgrove system from the C-sharp script component uh, and from the Python language as well. So um, if you share this library to uh, your friends, your friend can invoke uh, the Mesgrove system from Python and from C-sharp, and the data will stay inside the C-sharp scripts, and they can use that for further use inside a script without having to, you know, uh, output it to to Grasshopper first, or, um, or you know, um, otherwise they will have to use the visual component that we build for them to get a mesh growth and then import that to their uh, Python script. So if they want to have a, uh, want to set up something more like a loop, it will be very inconvenient. Uh, okay, so. So let's. Uh, so yesterday, what we set up, which is um, the basic Visual Studio solutions that compile into a plugin called Mesgrove.gha. Uh, this plugin has only one component, uh, and for now, the component doesn't do anything apart from just taking a bunch of inputs and read in the input, but doesn't do anything yet. Okay. Okay. So um, let's describe the overall um, uh, approach of the algorithm first before we actually implement. Okay. So the Mesgrove system, there are two major uh, mechanism, okay, and two helpful but not crucial uh, mechanism. Okay, so two essential mechanism uh, for this to work is first each vertex should push each other away, no matter whether they are directly connected or not. So basically, we attach, we kind of attach a vertical sphere to each of uh, the vertex, and you we use the sphere to push them out in the same way that is identical to how we use the circle uh, to you know, uh, push out all the vertices of the polylight on the first day. But now instead of circle, we're using sphere. Okay, the code, is, is, the code for that part is almost identical uh, to, to what we did uh, on the first day. Okay, okay and, as, and every time we move this guy to the next iteration, remember everything is due in iterations, so each time they move away from each other a little bit by little bit, and just about they become fully separated. So um, if the end deal with triangle mesh, so if we split this edge into two, we have to split also split the two flanking triangles into two halves. Okay, so we end up with four triangles in in total. Okay, so and we have a new vertex with like uh, four new triangles rather than uh, two. So this vertex will also have a sphere attached around them, so they will push the other one even more. Okay, and they they will grow and you know the edge. We get larger, you know, the, and they will keep be, uh, keep being split over time, and we do it until you know we we turn off, we switch off the um, the splitting uh, flag or boolean value, or uh, if the number of vertices has reached a maximum uh, budget. Uh, for example, we're gonna set it at uh, 
for this for today, probably you should hard cap the number of vertices to five thousand. Okay, and then if you want everything after everything is working fine, you want to go adventurous, you can get you can set it up to like a hundred uh, thousand and let it run overnight, for example. Okay, but for today, let's just keep it at five thousand. I, I find that five thousand is kind of a, a good number that give you like pretty nice um, result without slow down your computer too much. Okay, or freeze uh, grasshopper too much. Okay, so those are the two essential mechanisms. So, Having these two would give you some like pretty um, um, decent looking result already, and then we have two extra mechanism that is helpful but not essential. Okay, so even if you don't do these two extra mechanism, it's still fine. Uh, so at length constraint, which means that as a left, you know, this field will push this guy further and further away. Okay, and it's true that if they get too long, they will get split. But you know, after they reach a certain uh, threshold for the uh, total number of vertices, they will not split anymore and they will just simply move out from each other without being split. And there might be a chance that they will drift away too far, the edge might get too long, okay? Because, you know, uh, there are so many spheres and the other sphere might push them so far away, so this edge might end up like being too long. So we have this extra mechanism to check that if they are too long, we will just snap them back to the desired position, which is two, okay? So the overall result will look more organized. Otherwise, you have some like really long edge and some really flat, uh, um, overly flat and um, overly flat uh, regions of the final result. Okay. How can it get too long if it's split then before? Uh, but eventually, we will. When it hits the budget, it will not split anymore. When we reach like five thousand vertices, it will not split anymore. But it's still moving out. Okay. So that effect is only useful at the end of the process. Okay. So so this. this so even if we run the code, the code most of the time will not create any move vector, it just returns zero because they, they're still overpacked, right? But at near the end where they become like overly relaxed or, or overly pushed out, that constraint will actually kick in and actually produce some non-zero vector that try to move the uh, each, each pair of uh, connected vertex back to their um, reasonable uh, length, okay? And then finally, this is really nice to have a bending resistance. So each pair of triangle will try to be flat. Now, of course, there's no way they will be flat completely because other force we try to fold them to bend them and this one we try to spring them back so the final result is a compromise or an equilibrium between these all of these uh, seemingly conflicting force so the fears try to push them away the ethylene constraint try to push them try to bring them together if they get too far and the bending resistance will you know uh, try we make them flat while the other one that doesn't really care if they're flat or not they will just like try to fold them so that they have packed and you know uh, do not collide with each other as much as possible okay so this is a pretty bottom-up process, right? Uh, we simulate each individual behavior of each edge, okay? Uh, each edge doesn't have a lot of knowledge about what is going on beyond its, its neighbors, right? So it just care if I collide this one, I just put uh, my neighbors around, my immediate neighbors around. But if all of them do this thing simultaneously, simultaneously at the same time in parallel, then you end up with the overall uh, kind of result. So it's a kind of a bottom-up um, process where you simulate this individual region and the outcome kind of slowly emerges from all of these uh, four mechanisms interacting with each other. Okay, so... Okay, as I showed you yesterday, this is the influence of the bending resistance. Um, so the higher the bending um, um, resistance, uh, so, uh, by the way, each of these behavior is controlled by a single, um, not, 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 not controlled, but like uh, overallly controlled by a, a master number to, so that the user can specify how much this is influential compared to the other. So um, we can make the bending resistance four times as strong as the sphere um, collision, for example. Okay, and by changing the ratio between um, their weight or their strength, uh, that is how the user uh, kind of uh, tuning the uh, the input parameters and get like slightly different uh, get um, different uh, outcomes. Okay. Okay, so yesterday uh, we talked about roughly about mesh in Rhino Common and why it is not really suitable because mesh in Rhino Common, it. It's, it, it, it's usually, uh, it was designed to start static mesh. Static means the mesh is not expected to change much, okay? Because every time if you want to edit the mesh or change the mesh, it, it would be fairly uh, costly, okay? Because all of the information that the mesh has is, you know, phase one yellow, it knows that it's, it is made of vertex zero, three, two, and one. 
Okay, but if you query the machine learning common and ask it to give you the edge, or if you have an edge and try to query which face that is in being a part of, then you can get that information, but it's actually not a bit like inelegant to use. You, you don't know. And also, you even if you have an edge in Rhino Common, um, you there's there is no there's not a direct way to figure out which is the next edge in the same polygons. Okay, it's possible to figure out, but it, you know this is gonna take some computation logic to figure it out. So the mesh in Rhino Common is not like very convenient if you want to do to query it about the connectivity information or. Um, or to edit it. Well, when you split the, the mesh phase, you need to know about the connectivity so that you can split the right edge, right? So, and the, the mesh in, in uh, the mesh, the standard mesh class or mesh data type in a Rhino uh, common library is not like particularly suitable for that kind of uh, operations. So, half edge mesh is an alternative way to present mesh, okay? And um, it's a pretty well known uh, algorithm. And um, for Rhino Common, um, some uh, I honestly don't uh, remember the name of the person who um, implemented it, but he's worked together with uh, Daniel Piker, the author of Kangaroo Wand, um, to implement this algor uh, algorithm into um, into Grasshopper, and he called this library Plankton. Okay, so we don't have to implement everything um, uh, implement everything related to the half edge mesh from from scratch. We just kind of know the overall. Um, the overall uh, level uh, of how it works behind the scene, and then we can use this library uh, right away. Okay, without fun understand fully how it works inside the black box. Okay. So, let's say that we want to represent the same mesh. Okay, um, but using a half edge uh, strategy or a half edge um, data structure or half edge like uh, technique to describe the edge. Okay, so we have a list of vertices. Okay, and now. Um, rather than um, having an edge going through, let's say that we want to make an edge going from three to two, and you know uh, later we have more edge, and the edge will be connected together into a polygonal face, right? But look at this edge. Rather than having an edge represent as um, a pair of number whose order doesn't matter, so in, in Rhino common mesh, it's just a single pair of number. And the order of the number doesn't matter. If you say edge going from three to two or two going to three, it doesn't matter. It's basically the same edge, right? And in Rhino Common, that's just the case. And also intuitively, that's all we care. However, you will see that knowing the direction of the edge is so crucial to uh, making the right code. So the half edge match is actually represent the edge by by by, by two half edge. It half edge has an arrow, okay? So overall there is one edge, but they explicitly split into like two mini uh, kind of record in in the code, okay? And so the yellow half edge and this one, and each of them have an index number, okay? So this is the next pair of half edge, okay? And they always goes together. If you look at the index, it's always, you know, they, they're always like next to each other, zero, one, two, three, okay? All right, and each edge has a direction. Each edge has a, um, a unique starting index, a starting vertex. So edge two start from vertex two, and has a unique uh, ending vertex. Okay, and because it explicitly know which one is starting and which one is ending, it's very easy to follow along, and have a complete cycle of the polygons. Okay. Uh, so those are the other edge, okay? And you see that the the edge and the twin or the sibling always go in there. So two half edge make up a real edge, okay? But we so the real edge is something that we think in our head, but actually what is stored inside is actually two half edge, okay? Okay, and and after we have the edge, then the face is just basically face one is basically just half f two, four, six, and zero, okay? So. Uh, Okay, forget about this part. Let's look at this part first. Okay, so each half edge explicitly knows about the start vertex. So if you have an edge in your C sharp code that has half edge number two, and you ask for the start vertex, it will tell you right away that it starts from from vertex two. Okay, and then it know the previous. It immediately know about the previous and the next half edge in the cycle. So if you add uh, edge half edge two to give you which is the next half edge in this cycle, it will tell you that it's it's number four. Okay, and if you know it's number four, you can easily walk to number six. 
using the same logic. Okay, so each half edge know about which 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 is the next and the previous half edge in the polygonal cycle. Okay, now we um, here I use a polygonal mesh, but uh, in our case in our mesh grove everything will be triangle anyway, so it's going to be even simpler to work with. Okay, and each half edge will immediately know which phase it is part of. Okay, so half edge two, the adjacent phase is uh, number one. Okay. It immediately know that information. You can query it directly. Uh, now, half edge two doesn't know about the other adjacent fate immediately, but that's very easy because if and half half edge um, two know that its sibling must be number three because it always goes together, right? So if I'm two, I'm, uh, add one to it. I can I can like know my sibling and I can query my sibling for the adjacent phase, which is zero. So you have so if if you have if if I give you a, a given half edge you can almost very simply tell all of the connectivity information right away, okay? Now, of course, in the diagram, it's very easy to look and point out which one is close to which one, but of course, when we write in a computer, they don't have this diagram, they just rely on those number to figure out which one is next to which, to, uh, to which one, okay? So, all right, so half edge two, so these are the example. Half, the start vertex of half edge two is vertex number two, okay? The next half edge of half edge two is is half edge number four. Okay, the previous half edge is number zero, and adjacent phase is the phase number one. Okay. Okay, so in our code, okay, so this part we're gonna um, do later. So this is actually the C sharp code that we're gonna write later. Okay, so let's go in the code and go to so now we our visual studio solution have two file one file represent uh, one file represent our mesh grove system okay and the other one is just a GHC component just the grasshopper component okay and, and, and the grasshopper component are pretty much just read in the data and send the data to the actual class. Okay, so 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 the component code is basically just the user interface part. The all of the computational logic actually happened in here. Okay, this from yesterday. This from the end of yesterday. Okay, so this part uh, is currently being commented out. So these are the command symbol in the C sharp language. So if you want to command a block of code, you do the symbol. You do this pair of symbol, okay? So everything in be between. So this part is uh, being commenced out, so it should be green. However, this projector it has a problem with contrast, so it appears black, okay? <laughs> All right. So what do we store in the class mesh grove system? So whenever we have a mesh grove system, what what sh what does it supposed to store in inside? Well, it should store the mesh object, right? Or namely the plankton mesh, okay? So it should have a plankton mesh. So plankton mesh, okay. So that is the data type, which should be green, but again, it's difficult to see the color. And the name of this variable gonna be PT mesh, okay. All right. So again, we are designing the class here, and whenever we design the class, the first thing is we have to know which variable that each object of this class should store, okay. So each mesh grow system object should store should have a, internally a, a plankton mesh object. And this one we make it private, okay? So nobody can screw it up from the outside. <laughs> and then we have a bunch of parameters. So these are just numbers um, to drive the uh, computations. Um, those are just the uh, parameters. Hang on a second. Uh, Okay, so the next is um, a boolean value called grow. So this is public, okay? And this follows the first. So the mess, so 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 this boolean is just an extra mechanism. Um, it will come from uh, the actual value will come from outside the grasshopper component. So it will be from the uh, main grasshopper script. Uh, this is an extra way for the user to temporarily switch off the splitting of the edge. Okay, so if 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 um, if the edge is like growing too fast. 
you know, the user can set it to false by flipping the, 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 the Boolean value in the grasshopper canvas, and it will stop the splitting part. It will only do the sphere relaxation, but this, the, the, uh, the splitting will temporarily stop until it's back on again. Okay, okay and then uh, this one is, next one is simple, max vertex count. Okay. This one, uh, we don't have a default value yet, but, um, because the, the actual value will come from outside. So this will be just a hard cap on the number. Of, um, so, 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 so the growth will stop anyway if the number of vertex reach this maximum budget. Uh, it should be private. So in the uh, in the complete code I gave you, I think I uh, accidentally um, specified it as public, but it should be private. Um, the the reason is because um, well for for our workshop it doesn't matter, but you know um, it's something that we don't want to expose to 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 the user from outside of the class. We make it private, and by naming convention, private variable always start with lowercase, and public always start with uppercase. Okay. The next one is also just a public uh, boolean value called use archery. Okay, so this is just a switch where the user will decide to whether to turn on the optimization algorithm for the sphere collision or not. And the reason we do that is just so that you can have a comparison. So you can flip the switch and see how fast or how slow it, it, it runs. But most of but for all of the time we gotta turn this on anyway. Otherwise we'll be very slow. Okay, and the next group of parameters, they are just number that specify the strength of each uh, mechanism. So the F length constraint waste. Okay, so I will explain what the waste actually means uh, mathematically later. But think of it as a number to indicate how strong this constraint, this this behavior should be compared to the sphere relaxation or the bending resistance behavior. And then the next is collision distance. Okay, so it's basically the uh, two times the radius of the sphere. Okay, so if the uh, collision distance is two units, it means that each vertex should try to be at least two units away from on the other one. Okay, um, so it's something that we allow the user to change, but uh, we will keep it as one for now, most of the time. The next one is collision weight, okay, so waste. So this is how we tell how strong the sphere should be pushing out relative to the other force. And the next one is the bending resistant weight. Bending resistant weight, okay. PT mesh. Yeah. In the file, we have it mesh, not PD mesh. Which file? In the file that we have. Let me double check the hands out again. This is the handout of day three. Not, don't use the one from day two. Yeah, but if you, well, that is the complete uh, project for reference, which is on day three, okay? But if you start from the result that we get yesterday, we don't have anything here, so we're just writing everything from scratch anyway, so. We're working from from yesterday, okay? And if you want to look at the final result, if you want to fast forward, look at the complete solution on the day three handout, okay? Yeah. Yesterday VS00, which is like almost empty, okay? But, but, but don't, okay, so don't, don't use the zero 01 from yesterday, use the zero 01 from, from today, uh, hands up, okay? If, if you need to have some reference. Okay, again, guys, so if you want to um, have a reference file, use the file from day three hands out, not the reference file from day two, okay? Okay, let's carry on. Um, mass growth system. Okay, so those are all the uh, variables that we need for now, okay? 
there's going to be some private uh, list of vectors, but those are for the internal computation. Those are not uh, parameters that we change from the outside. Those are just for internal computations, okay? All right, so now the uh, constructor of our uh, system, okay? So each class, again, always have a constructor so that we can actually create the object of this class, okay? So we have a public constructor, okay? Co the constructor doesn't have a return type. And the name of the constructor functions always match the name of the class. Okay, so public mesh growth. Okay, uh, this constructor take in a Rhino mesh and automatically convert it to the plankton mesh and start it in this uh, private variable here. Okay, so it should take in a Rhino mesh and the name is just mesh. Okay, and we call this the starting mesh. Which one? Starting mesh. Starting mesh. This is not a public. This is the name of the input parameter to the functions. Yeah. Okay. So let's convert starting mesh. So starting mesh dot, and hopefully your autocomplete will show a function called to plankton mesh. Okay. Now the reason why this function is available and why autocomplete see it, uh, well, before I carry on, let's finish this statement by having an empty pair bracket. It's a function, so you know, always bracket. Okay, so this function, once it finished, it will return an object of type plankton mesh. Okay, so this whole thing will give us an object of plankton mesh, and we will just start in here. So we will say pt mesh equal to to the result that the functions give us. Okay, um, so this function is obviously um, was defined in the plankton library, and it was the reason why it's available to us, and why autocomplete can s like see it and like sh like show us in the autocomplete uh, uh, dropdown box is because because of this library, because of the plankton and the plankton G -Ed library that we previously uh, linked to or add to our Visual Studio project. Okay. If you don't have the external library, you will get, if I, for some reason, remove this library, or if the, the actually a path to that file is missing, uh, you will see a red weekly line uh, appear here and saying that there is no function called to plankton mesh that can be applied on an object of type, of type mesh. Basically, that's what I say. And your code will not uh, build at all. Okay. Uh, so if it disappears, you, you go to uh, Windows and say Reset Windows Layout. Mm. Okay. Okay, so now our, again, um, our so far we ha um, there's still no functionality here here yet, just the basic constructor and the um, a bunch of uh, parameters. Okay, now we define an extra utility function. So at any time from the outside of the class, we want to retrieve the current status of the class so that we can output and display on the screen. We want to retrieve the, the mesh, right, and convert it to Rhino mesh. Okay, and we can do it in one line. There's also a function that take in a plankton mesh, and you say dot to Rhino mesh, and it will give you a standard Rhino mesh object which you can output to the Grasshopper canvas, and it will be displayed on your viewport correctly. Okay, so in order to make it more convenient, let's provide a utility function for this uh, class called public. Okay, this is a function, not a constructor. This is a normal function, so it's public and it has a return type. The return type will be just, just an, uh, just the Rhino mesh data type. Okay, and the name should be get Rhino mesh. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, this function doesn't need any extra parameters. Okay. So this also has one line. And you can see as we time in the code here, even though I open the curly bracket and close the curly bracket, which means that it looks like this function has finished, right? But there's this error here. Uh, and if you hover the mouse over, it will say right away, not on code path returns a value, which means that you just declare, you just claim that this function should return a mesh, but the body is empty, which means that it's return void. So it's like it warns you right away. This is something that Python will not be able to do because Python, in Python, um, you don't specify the return type. So if you make a mistake, there's no way Python knows that you make a mistake to warn you, for example. But in C sharp, you know, this kind of mistake can, you know, prevent even before you press the build button. <laughs> okay. So get Rhino mesh. So this is simple. So we will say, uh, PT mesh, so so the current mesh, the per current factor mesh that we have at the moment that this function is invoked. Okay, so PT mesh dot to Rhino mesh. Okay, this is a function. So let's close the brackets. Okay, and this whole thing is a Rhino mesh object. Okay, so we can just simply return. Okay, so we return the entire whole thing. Okay. Ret well, return the result of that function, not the entire thing. Okay, so for those of you who not, you know, um, still, um, for those of you who are still new to this uh, uh, functions and class, uh, you will see that this is a function, but internally it uses another function to get the result to return to another user. Okay. Okay, so those are simple, just the utility functions. Okay, do you, that should be easy to fix. Okay. And what, what does it say? Yeah. Okay, um, so now f we have so this is now the going to be the real important uh, functions called update. So public. So this function is the one that actually changes the mesh to the next iterations. Okay. So whenever this function is called, um, the mesh will slightly move. The vertex will slightly move. Okay. So public void. This function does not return anything because it it just modify the the PT mesh directly. So it, and, and and because it. It modifies this thing, uh, and we can see the the the, uh, the 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 modification effect by just like query the PT mesh after we run the function. So so this function doesn't need to return anything. Okay. Public void update. Okay. And the body just leave it empty for now. Okay. Right, and again, what we want is that whenever we call update, and then we call, we, we query PT mesh again, PT mesh should be slightly different. Okay, okay, but the logic here is gonna be this is like the main focus of logic is gonna be, um, um, you know, um, the topic for a, um, a, um, in the moment, the main focus. But for now, um, this is like a bare bone um, kind of class, so we can use it. Um, let so this is definition of class we, we not we haven't used it yet. Okay, so let, let's use it. Let's let's use it by exposing it uh, in our in our uh, um, in, in the code for our Grasshopper component. Okay, so so far this this is like independent from Grasshopper. This is just like geometry logic from Rhino Common. Okay, there's no Grasshopper things going on here. Okay, so let's switch back to the the definition of our Grasshopper component. Okay, and go. Okay, so. The solve instance functions. Okay, so remember um, we did a similar kind of example where we have a component that store a pawn inside its memory, and whenever solve instance run, it take the current position of the pawns and move it to the next one. Here we also have to create the same kind of persistent memory effect. Okay, so we need to declare a mesh growth object or a mesh growth a mesh growth system object 
not inside the self instant. If you declare self inside the self instant, it will like disappear after self instant finish, and then the next time it runs, it will just create a brand new object, and then you're gonna start from scratch again. You will never see the things evolve iteration by iteration. So we're gonna create an object right here, outside of the functions, but still inside the class that represent our Grasshopper component. Actually, uh, I think I think it's already there in the code I gave you. So if you scroll up, do you see this line in your code? Okay, so I already put it, I, I should have removed it, so you have to type it manually, but okay, anyway, it's a minor thing. So this is an object of type mesh growth system, okay, so, so this is the class that we just define in this file, okay. Okay, so we create an object of this type, and this is the name of the variable, and this variable lives inside the class that represents our graspable component, right, so each component will have its own kind of mesh growth system object, okay. Uh, it's private, okay, because we don't want anybody from outside of this component code to modify it. Okay, so we call it my macro system. I I tend to put in the word my. Uh, well, when I code thing for real, I never use code a variable my something. But you know, usually during instructional course, I I put in word my to emphasize this is actually a specific object, uh, a version, a specific version of the class. Okay, so if I have a part three, I usually call it my point, or like your part or my first point. So. We call it my uh, mesh growth system. Okay, it will live inside here, and currently it's just a variable that doesn't point to anything. Currently, the value is null. Okay, we haven't construct an actor mesh growth system to store inside this variable yet. Okay. All right. So let's go down here in a solve instant. Okay. So after we written all of the parameters, now we can actually use the parameters to um, do something. Um, so this is just a command line to separate out the boring input uh, reading and the actual main um, data trick, uh, the main uh, logic here. Okay, so let's type the code here. Now, uh, if the user hit the reset button, so if the input reset, which is stored in the variable reset here, so if I reset is true, okay, then we we either initialize or, in case it has already been initialized, we reinitialize this variable to a new mesh growth system. Okay, so we call the constructor, get a value, and put it in here. So, if, so if reset, then this variable will take a new, a new, a new, um, a new value or a new object value of mesh growth system. Okay, so we call the constructor, and the constructor asks for a writer mesh, right? Remember when we write a constructor, it asks for a writer mesh. Where did we get a writer mesh? Well, the writer mesh is from here. It's from it's from outside the, uh, the grasshopper component. It's from the main grasshopper canvas. Okay, so we're gonna move it here. All right, as simple as that. Okay, so if that is reset uh, being true, if reset is not true, uh, uh, if reset is true, we always reinitialize it. But otherwise, in the normal part of the code, we just call the update of the assist, uh, on the system. So my my macro system dot update. Okay, currently update is empty, so calling this has no effect. Okay, but later when we put on the code, it will take the current uh, PT mesh that's stored inside macro system and change the vertex slightly. Okay. So each time this component run, it will basically call update once. Okay, so every time it runs, you're gonna see the vertex move a little bit and a little bit. Okay, so you have to run this component multiple times to see the whole kind of um, motions uh, sequence. Okay, so it's update the PT mesh internally, but we have to again output it so that people can see it, right? Uh, So the final one is just output so da dot set data. Okay, so we're gonna send data to the output part called I believe I think we name it um, just yeah mesh. Uh, this is the name of the output part. So I will copy the name carefully, put it in here. That's the name of the output part. And the data that will be actually sent there is the Rhino mesh that we retrieve from the mesh growth system for, for my mesh growth system object. So my Math pro system dot get rhino mesh. Okay. 
So, so that's, remember that function will, will convert the internal PT mesh to a rider mesh, and then we just take that and send it to the output port. Okay, let's click the build button to make sure that we don't have any error. Okay, but we're not going to test this yet because there's really no visual uh, results coming out. So even if it runs, uh, um, you won't be able to see any, any difference. Okay, so if you have an error and it may help, uh, let me know. Okay, good, no error really. <laughs> All right, again, so now if we run this thing, um, update we call but update is empty and then if you output the mesh the mesh will look identical right so even though there's a lot of like code being executed um, the, diff the, the result will be no difference so just to help us see how the codes run let's go back to the update functions of the mesh growth system and if you don't want to navigate to the update function manually again just right click on the update function and say go to definition okay it will take you to the definition of the code right away Okay, um, again, right click on update and say go to definitions. It will take you to, to the place where we're going to write some like uh, simple toy fake uh, piece of code in an update function just to get something running. Okay, um, just want to show, before we go on, just want to show you another feature, okay? Uh, you don't have to follow this, just want to show you. Uh, update, if you right click on it and rather than go to the actual definition, if you want to have a pick look like into what's going on you can say pick definitions and it will open a mini windows okay so that you can look into that one all right and then you can if after you're done you can close it so pretty convenient all right all right so what's going on in here is i will just make a very simple edit to the starting uh, mesh, okay? So I will just move vertex zero by 0 0.1 unit along the x-axis. So when you test it, you will see your starting mesh, the first vertex is gonna be, you know, slightly move, okay? Just so that we can verify that the code is running uh, for real, okay? So um, let's make a very simple um, statement. So um, P team, so let's first read out the, um, the coordinates of the first vertex, okay? So P T mesh, okay? dot vertices okay so dot vertices is the list of vertices okay so you see vertices plural it kind of imply that this is a list object okay and we're gonna read out the first one okay uh, now if you read out the first one uh, the data type of this whole thing is not upon 3d it's it's uh, the data type for this one is it's a plankton vertex now, Plankton doesn't use uh, Rhino uh, Pond 3D directly because it decided to re-implement its own Pond 3D to make it the computation easier. But for us, we need a Pond 3D, right? Uh, thankfully, you can easily convert the uh, Plankton kind of Pond 3D to the Rhino type of Pond 3D by just say dot Pond 3D. Okay. Okay, and let's start this in the, a temporary variable called v0 okay so that's vertex 0 okay okay and let's move that vertex v0 okay so so actually v0 is a copy of the vertex coordinates okay so changing v0 will not change the vertex okay so but let's change v for now let's change the value v0 and then later we have to like put that v0 value back into the vertex okay so, so v0 plus equal to new vector. Okay, so we just move it along the vector whose coordinates is 0 0.1. 0 0.1 is, okay, it's not too small, so we should see the effect.
All right, so V01 is now a property, and now we have to use this new value of V0 to actually modify the vertex 0, okay? Remember, when we read it out, this, this is basically just make a copy of the vertex coordinates. And if we modify this copy, it will not affect the actual vertex of the PT mesh. Okay, so now we have to say PT mesh dot vertices, I think, and let's say vertices and then dot set vertex. Okay, so this function will actually change the vertex. Okay, so this function will take in four parameters. The first is the index of the uh, vertex that we want to modify, and we want to modify vertex zero, right? And what is the new coordinate of that vertex zero? Well, the coordinate will be the dot x, dot y, dot z stored inside this variable here. So we give it v0 dot x, v0 dot y, and v0 dot z, okay? All right, I hope you understand those um, simple lines. It's fine, a bit, um, you know, quite a lot of work just to move a vertex. Can I, what, what? it would be nice if you can just say PT mesh dot vertex zero dot move to, okay? But if, before you know where to move to, you actually have to do some math to, you know, update the position, you know, and then write that result back into the, the vertex coordinate, okay? All right, now we can test this. Okay, let's build. Make sure we have no error. Okay, again, if you don't know what it is, hover the mouse over, and they say the first is, is the index of the vertex that you want to modify, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right, if you build and have no error, let's go to Grasshopper and reload. Grasshopper, uh, re uh, reload the GHA. In this case, I just like fire Grasshopper from scratch, so it's, it will be load from scratch anyway. And then open the uh, Grasshopper script that we kind of set up yesterday. Okay, you open it, you're gonna see it read. I will explain why it reads in a moment. Even if your code builds successfully, this component seems to like not be running. All right. So the starting mesh. Let me show you what the starting mesh looks like in, in in this case. So if I turn on the preview, well, it's just a very simple like just a few triangles. Okay. And I think in uh, vertex zero, I think is this one, and the code is supposed to move vertex zero. Every, so every time this thing runs, so every time the timer forces force this thing to run, you will see vertex zero move to the right by 0 0.1 unit, okay? All right, so why this thing is currently um, red? Well, the error is that pesky, uh, extremely annoying error in c -sharp language, object reference not set to an instant of an object, which is so extremely weird in, even when you say it in plain English. It basically means that a variable is null. Which one is that? Um, let me show you. It is this one. Okay, so this one, when you first open the Grasshopper script, the C-sharp variable is null definitely, right? And it will stay null until until reset button is hit, okay? So that's why when you first open the script, you have to hit the reset button for that constructor to kick in. Okay, and now it has some value, all right? And if you release the button, so if you click the button, it's re reset, okay? If you release it, it runs again, and it moves it to the right, okay? Let me turn off the starting mesh so that you don't you see only one version. Okay. Let me turn off the preview. Okay. And if you if you turn on the timer, you will see mesh zero being moved to the right by zero point one. Uh, 
Okay, raise your hand if you need my help. Okay. All right, so we know kind of how the, the, the code is being run, right? So we know, uh, so let me visualize everything uh, again. So whenever that timer tick, so Vincent will execute, okay? And whenever so Vincent is execute, it will read in the data, okay? Uh, well, that's part is easy. Uh, and then it will just call this function update. And, e and every time update run, if I look at the pick definition, it just move the vertex to one unit, uh, 0 0.1 unit, and then we immediately get the result out and display. Okay, so that's how the code run in cycle, essentially. Okay, now the update, we have to, of course, uh, do the actual thing here, so rather than just move one vertex, okay? <clears throat> so the other day, uh, um, when we do the sphere relaxations, um, we for so for each vertex, so PT mesh here, and PT mesh has the dot vertices that store all of the, of the vertex, right? Now for each vertex, we want to cross check with other vertex to see if they overlapping. If they overlapping, we have to somehow create the move vector and remember that's move vector because there, there will be more than just move, one move vector. So each sphere will you know, take a move vector from one sphere, from one neighbor sphere, but also like might be more. So we add up all of the move vector and then divide by the total, okay? So we need a way to keep track of those total move vector plus the number of vector that we have like contribute so far to each of the vertex, okay? So in order to help us to keep track of that, we're gonna create two private list, okay? So the private list is going to live inside the mesh growth system. It's private because it's only meant to be used for the computation, uh, for the internal logic, okay? We never want to, like, uh, somebody else from outside to query it, well, except for debugging, but, you know, we're not going to do that here. So we have a private list of a vector 3D. Uh, Fred, you have to unblock uh, plankton.dl and also plankton.gh.dl, so there's two files to unblock. Yeah, just in case. Okay. Uh, so private list vector 3D, and this one is private, so uh, we start with lower case. The name is total wasted move. Okay. I will explain what the word wasted mean in a second, but for now you just you can think of it as the total move vector for each of the vertex. Okay. Okay. There's no value; it's just an empty variable, so the value is actually null. Okay, and the other one is the total count of vectors that each, each vertex has received so far. So we're gonna have a list of number, but we're gonna use double instead of integer, okay? And we can call this total count, but I was call it total waste, okay? And I will explain why we call it waste. In a moment. So total waste plural, okay? Because this is not just the waste for a single vertex, but it's so each vertex has a total weight, okay? Okay, so now in the update, let's delete this kind of uh, toy code. All right, so each time update runs, we have to prepare the content of this tool list. Okay, so we've make so every time update run before we compute any of the uh, collision or whatever, we have to initialize total weight move to a list of zero vectors. Okay, and a list of total weight to a list of just zero and zero, okay? So at first, uh, each, each vertex will have no total move and no total weight or total count, okay? But later on, we will go into the collision and they will start to add some move vector for each of the vertex and some weight, some, some total weight or count to each of the vertex, okay? So we have to prepare the content of this guy. So total move, total weight move equal to a new empty list of vector 3D, okay? 
total weight equal to a new empty list of a double. By the way, that's your code run now. Okay. Okay, and now, so this is an empty list. Now we have to go in and fill in with zero vector and double, and we're gonna fill in as many zero vector as there are vertices. Okay. So if you have five thousand vertices, this list will contain five thousand zero vectors. Okay. So for int i equal to zero, i less than pt mesh dot vertices dot count. Okay, I plus plus. Okay, so this loop will run for as many times as there are vertices in in our current mesh. Okay. Uh, this one we can use the for each because we don't really care the va about the value of a counter. Uh, it's really preference. The, the difference in performance is relatively uh, minor. The for each loop is safer because you don't uh, accidentally uh, make write a silly stopping condition and make this loop run forever. <laughs> so the for each loop is generally uh, re re recommended. Okay, so total weight move. Okay, we're gonna add an empty vector to the end of the list. Okay, so new vector three D. I think I misspelled the word wasted. Okay, so vector 3D. Okay. There are special C sharp syntax to make this like filling uh, uh, a list with a uh, same value easier. You know, we don't have to write a for loop, but I will show you that later. So now we have to do the class. Ah, uh, I'm missing. Um, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, I'm missing a closing bracket. Okay. Okay, so that's the preparations. Uh, okay, now we have a bunch of codes that go in and check every pair of vertices. If they are too close, then we have to add the weight vector to the right position in the list, okay? So let's say if we look at vertex 5 and vertex 10, and if they're too close, then we have to create a total a, a, move, a, a move vector, add it to the total weight move at position 5, and the total weight move at position 7. Uh, sorry, position 10, okay? And also we have to add the weight as well. So if, again, if we look at, uh, for example, if we, if we currently look at, at a vertex 5 and we're comparing it with vertex 7, if they're too close and if we decide to move them, we have to say total weights at position 5 increase by 1, okay? And total weights at position 10 increase by 1 because the total weights will keep track of how much move vector, how many, how many uh, move vectors have been uh, contribute or are or, or, uh, influencing that particular vertex, uh, uh, that particular vertex. Okay. So now, rather than writing all the code here and make this function update really long, okay, a good strategy is to package this, the part of the code I'm going to write next in another function, okay, and then I just invoke that function here. So the code is short because it just has one name that has a meaningful English. Uh, kind of uh, name or description, okay? So let's create an empty function here called pub. Uh, this is this is sh this should be private because it's only supposed to be used internally. So private void, and we call it process collision. Process collisions. Okay, and this the body is, is empty for now. Okay, and then 
the function is we'll take care of the active collision, okay? Uh, so the code, we're gonna be a bit long right in here, but then we need to invoke this function. So we're gonna invoke this function right here. Um, so this is private, okay? So naming convention is that private variable is lowercase, but private functions is still uppercase, okay? So that's why it's processed with an uppercase P. All right, and here we need to in actually invoke those functions, okay? So this is the definition of the function, and this is we invoke it. And this way, we separate the code. So rather than writing all of the code in here, we kind of bring it to a separate function to make the code more modularized and can easier to, to follow. Because later on, apart from process collision, we also need to process bending stiffness. Okay, and if we write all of the code for everything inside the update function, update function will look like very long and, 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 and big. Okay, so the process collision, so again, the job of the process collision is to figure out the overlapping and add the relevant vector and the weight to, to, to the element of this list, right? So now we're gonna do the football team matching again where we need to visit every vertex and compare it to uh, the other, okay? So let's read out the vertex uh, and start it in a temporary variable. So in a vertex scout, count equal to to pt mesh dot vertices dot count. Okay, so we just read out a value and start it in a shorter name variable just to make it more easier to to read the code. All right, for and then we have a for loop that do the uh, the the pairing or the pair matching, just like in a football match, uh, just like in a football uh, tournament. So for in i equal to zero, i less than vertex count, so we go to the final vertex. Plus plus. All right, and for each of vertex i, we need to match it with the potential uh, vertex j. And j going from i plus one, okay. Remember the uh, football team like matching logic. We only match each team with the one that come that come next in the list. Okay, not not the previous team. Go to end list. Okay, so now let's check if the uh, vertices are too close. So first we have to read out the two uh, vertex and convert it to Pond 3D because again, remember, uh, Franklin store vertex using their own kind of uh, data structure or, or data type. Okay, so, um, I gotta do everything in one line here, but let's try. so pt mesh dot vertices, the i vertices, okay, and convert it to pawn 3D. Okay. So that is the first point at position i, and if I subtract it, so I will read out the, the, the same point but as index i, okay, and I subtract them, okay. Okay, the slide has not finished yet, so if you see an error, don't worry. Okay, so this is the vertex i minus vertex j. Okay, remember this one is j, okay? Then we will get a vector going from j to i, right? And we call this vector move, okay? So it's not it's not the final answer for the move vector yet, but vector by 3D equal to move. Okay, um, the length of the move vector is obviously also the current distance of the um, of the uh, vertex pair i and j, right? So let's 
Let's read our move dot length and store it in current distance. So double current distance equal to move dot length. Okay, let's check if the current distance is further than the collision distance. If the current distance is like three, while the collision distance is only two, which means that these two are already far enough, then, then we can safely skip this pair of vertex and go to check the next pair. Okay? So, so if current distance is you know larger than the collision distance, okay? And where is collision distance? So collision distance is a variable that is belong to the class right here, right? So it was defined right here, okay? Now it doesn't have any value. The value will actually come in uh, from the grasshopper canvas, okay? So okay, so if 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 current distance is larger than collision distance, then we don't need to proceed further down here. We can say continue. So continue is a bit misleading because it doesn't continue. It means that it skip this current iteration and move to the next value of j. Okay, so we say if if current distance is larger than collision distance, then continue. Okay. Okay. If not, then we can we will do the actual uh, collision uh, logic here. So. Okay, so the next one, uh, there's going to be some straightforward math. Um, I don't have a diagram to explain it, but uh, it's the exact same logic that we did on the first day. Okay, so now the move vector is pointed in the right direction. It's put I away from J, right? But the amount, the length of the move vector is not quite correct yet. Okay, so we have to scale this to the correct amount. Okay, so it's going to be move equal to 0 0.5 times current distance minus collision distance divided by the current distance. Okay, so this is the right move amount that make the two vertex just go further enough so that they reach the collision, the, 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 the minimum uh, allowed collision distance. Okay, and that, that should be very obvious if you draw a little diagram why, why the map looks that way, okay? Okay, and finally, we need to, okay, so this is the move vector that's going to affect vertex i, right? And we need to record this by adding the move vector to the total weight move at position i, okay? And same for j. So j is going to move in minus move vector directions, okay? And we, so we have to add minus move to the total weight move at position j, okay? So I would say total weight move at position i, so square bracket i, at equal to move, okay? In case that you are looking at the reference code, it's got, you're going to see that the version that we're doing now is different from the uh, complete code, but it will become the same uh, uh, later today, okay? And then the total weight move at position j, gonna be minus equal move okay okay so that's a total weight move and then what about the total weight now remember the total weight is just a counter that keep track of how many vectors we have added to the sum of the total so far so the total weight of I gonna be increased by one okay because we just add a new vector to it so we just increase the counter by one, and then total weight for chase also increase by one.
Hmm. Okay, so let's recap a little bit. Uh, whenever updates run, we create an empty list of an empty list of vectors. So each vertex has their own vector that records how much move vector that has been like add or influence them so far. And the total ways to keep track of the total count of each individual uh, contributions, okay? Because later we need to compute the average, right? So that's why we need to keep track of the total count or the total ways so we can do the divisions. Okay, so at first everything is, um, yeah? Because later we will allow the ways to be non-integer. Yeah. Which will explain, require some explanation, but for now you can think of it as uh, just integer, okay? Uh, so, but and also if, even if you do integer later when you do the division, it will be converted to double uh, before it's to the, uh, anyway. So, okay. So again, we start with like zero. Okay. So every vertex at first have a total move and a total count. Okay. And then we call process collision. Process collision will check every pair, and if the pair overlap, it will decide to okay. If i and j is overlapping, then I will contribute a move vector to i and also increase the counter of i by one, okay? And same with j, okay? All right, so after process collision is done, we can actually, so at this line, if we look at, or if we query or print out the content of total waste and uh, total, wa total waste move and total waste, you will see that they, many of them will be non-zero, right? Uh, because they, they will be overlapping. And then we can use them to compute the average and then actually move the vertex to the next position. So far, what we have done so far is not moving them. We just compute how much they should move, okay? But we haven't actually used that move vector to, to change the position yet. Okay, so the next one, we're gonna actually change the position, but again, I don't want to write the code in here. I want to package those code in a separate private um, private uh, function, okay? So let's collapse the process collision, okay? Collapse it. Okay, and have another function called private void called update. Uh, I think okay in the uh, um, so if we can update vertex positions. Positions okay plural. Now in the reference code, I accidentally called it update vertex positions and velocities. Now, we're actually not doing velocity, so the name is actually wrong, okay? But with, um, so if you look at the uh, reference code, in, uh, you can change the name back to the correct one using the renaming factor, so you don't have to change it manually everywhere, okay? Update vertex positions. Uh, okay, and the body is empty for now. Okay, and we're gonna have to invoke these functions right here, right? So we invoke this function right here. So definition and invocations. Okay, so what is the body of update uh, vertex position? Well, we're gonna visit each vertex, right? So in i, equal to zero, i less than the vertex count, so pt mesh dot vertices dot count, i plus plus. Okay, so we are looking at vertex i now and we need to work out the average move vector for i, okay? And that's gonna be the total weight move at position i, okay, divided by the total weight at position i. Okay, and that is the average move vector. 
Okay, so I will just call it move. So, so the move is what it means that the actual move or the final move or the average move. Okay, but I think the name is there's no kind of conf um, confusion here, so I just call it move. Okay, and now we need to apply that move vector to move the vertices. Okay, so now we have to read out the uh, plankton vertices and convert it to point vertices. So PT mesh dot vertices dot uh, vertices at position I. Okay, convert it to to point three D. Okay, so after we convert the point three D. Okay. So this is the point 3D, and then we add the move vector to it, then we will get the new position that the vertex should be, okay? And the whole thing will be the new positions, okay? So let's save it in a point 3D variable called new position equal to the current position at the move vector. Okay. I think it's slightly different from the reference code, but it doesn't matter, it's still the same logic. Okay, and then we can use the x, y, z coordinate from this new position to actually set the new uh, vertex uh, position. So I will say PT mesh dot vertices dot set vertex. Okay, and we're gonna set vertex as position i because that's what we're dealing with. And the coordinate is gonna be new position dot x, new positions dot y, and new position dot z. And we almost finish. Okay. Okay, you see, uh, there's a still a small potential problem. You you see where? Division. Whenever you have a division, the first thing to ask yourself is, what, can this thing ever be zero? And you have a division by zero and like mess thing up. Of course you can. So if the vertex i happen to be already far enough from the other one, total weight will always stay zero because at first it stays zero, right? And if there is no, and if and when we do the the the, um, the vertex pair checking, if there if there is no like collisions, this thing will never happen, right? So this thing only happen when when the code pass through this line and. And so if there's no collision, the total weight will remain zero. And if you divide by zero, you will get an uh, error for that one, and it will screw up uh, like the whole system. And it will it's one of the bugs that is relatively hard to catch because it manifests itself in either an error message or you know uh, the vertex just like run completely um, you know weirdly. And when you look at that, like uh, the problem as it's being manifest visually, it's difficult to go back and you know know where it went wrong in the first place. So we have to safeguard. So if total weight of i remains zero, so equal equal zero. So, so equal equal is the um, C sharp way of doing the uh, equal uh, comparison. Okay. So a single equal means that we want to assign the value from the left hand side to the right hand side, but double equal means that we want to do the comparison, not the assignment. So if this thing is zero, then we say again continue. Which means that we skip this part and go to process the next vertex i. Okay. Yes. Okay. So don't do this step. But I, of course, a natural question is that can we reverse the logic and say this thing? So if it's not zero, then we I perform this step. Okay. Which is totally fine. You can totally do that. Uh, the thing is. Um, Many programmer, including me, we try to avoid nesting the curly bracket as much as possible. And here, you see, like we have five levels of nesting already. <laughs> so, by using the continue keyword and fit the logic, uh, the code is somehow a little bit like more linear and easier to read. You know. All right, we're almost done. Okay, so now if we run, everything should be fine. The vertex is moving. 
The only thing that missing is that the value of collision uh, distance. Okay, so for now we just use the value, but like we really haven't checked what the value came from yet. Okay, we just read it out. Now let's go back to GSC mass growth. Okay, one more step. Before we call the update, we need to so before the main logic part, we read in the um, the collision distance that the user supplies to the component, right? We need to pass this value into the macro system object so the update function can use it, right? So before you call an update, we have to say my macro system dot collision distance equal to i collision distance. So i is the, the input value and we just forward it to the macro system. Okay, and we do it every time if we run update. So every time the timer runs, we read in a new value, which means that if the user happened to change this value from from different runs, the new va the newest value will be used. Okay, which means that you don't have to click the reset button every time you see the value. You, this value will be changed and forward to the macro system live uh, every time. Or not live, but like uh, being updated every time. This this whole uh, this whole component run, okay? Now let's build it. Okay, so if you're not debugging, let's build in release mode to make sure that the code run at like full speed, okay? Okay, make sure that this said one file copy, okay? And one succeeded, okay? I'm going to reload. Uh, which one? In the reference code or what? No. Huh? In Are you talking about this file now or what? The other file? Where? In the I'm not sure. Hey, it doesn't complain. No, it does. Yeah, there's like a little red underscore here. So that symbol is not defined in the C sharp language. So there's no meaning. Yeah, it's invalid. But like triple equal, what, what does it mean? Like what 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 do you think it's supposed to mean? Uh, Okay, and is that from Java? Yeah, I think it's Java. Yes. Okay, I okay. Uh, apparently, C sharp does not support that. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's build and run. Right, Control R, reload, mass growth. Okay, and remember, you always get an error message. Uh, at first, so you have to hit the reset button one, turn on the timer, and seeing the mess. Ooh. Okay, the mice still is. Oh, the move doesn't look correct to me. Mm. 
make a mistake in it. Mm. Okay, guys, there is a slight mistake. Okay, the move direction is reversed. Um, so, um, according to the logic, we, sh we, we the move vector should be the vertex J minus I. So let's fix that. Yeah. Otherwise, instead of moving away, they're actually moving toward each other. Okay, just let me repeat once more for the people watching online. Um, there, there was a mistake in the code. Um, so in the move vector for the process collision, the move vector should basically be vertex J minus vertex I, okay? Previously, we have I minus J, which is wrong. It should be J minus I. Okay, and you should see the vertex being pushed out slightly now. If you increase the uh, the collision distance, they will be pushing out more. Okay, raise your hand if you need help. Okay, okay let's carry on. Wow, that's uh, a lot of work to fix finally. So, um, even at this stage, uh, we have no mass splitting yet. Uh, the sphere collision should react to the uh, collision distance, okay? So the, the larger we make the collision distance, the larger the sphere will be, and of course they will push out more, okay? And they just push out more uh, in whichever way that they can find, the nearest way they can find to escape. So that's why rather than pushing out in a linear fashion, they just like uh, go all over the place. Okay, I can... So the starting mesh that I gave you looks like this. Uh, it basically, it's basically just a rectangular mesh, and I run through this C sharp script that basically move the vertex. It it's just a very um, simple rectangular mesh, and I try I triangulate it. And this C subscript was basically just apply a random offset to the vertex because if you start everything flat, no matter how the sphere push out, how, how strongly push out, they will remain flat. That's why I we apply a small random offset here, 0 0.1 or 0 0.3 to make sure that they are not flat. Okay, so at this stage, even if you don't have any uh, um, phase splitting, uh, even though we only have a sphere collision, if you use a very dense mesh like this one, for example, uh, let's say I would do... 30 by 30, okay, and if I, a lot of mesh, right, and if of them have a sphere, you will see that they will still push out quite a bit, and you can have a very, uh, a really kind of uh, interesting result even at this stage. Grow static mesh, hang on a second. I should come in, turn on the display, uh, turn off this one, okay. And even at this stage, all right. So here we, I just like pre-compute all of the, uh, like pre-generate a lot of vertex and just let them push out. Okay.
so the trick here is that rather than pre-generate them, we have to add them on as they expanding. That is ensure they're kind of the most organic and looking kind of uh, surface generation. If you pre-generate them on more or less like a flat plane, and they're just pushing out, they will not be like that nicely packed, okay? But anyway, you, you get an idea. This whole demonstration is just to show you that, you know, the sphere relaxation, it will give you like a wiggling surface that is basically um, should not be self-intersecting or like uh, cross through each other. Okay, let's, we can get back to the code now and we're gonna change this back to three by three because that's like a minimum kind of starting condition we want. All right, save this, close this file. All right, so one small addition that we can change. Um, let's go to this part, go to the GSC mesh grow file. Now you notice that always the first time we run the thing, uh, you will, the first time you open the Grasshopper script, uh, you will get an error message because my mesh grow system like, is noon at the beginning. So that's why you have to hit the reset button once to initialize it. Uh, it's, we, we can also automatically force this line to run at the first time the script opens. So, okay, so we run this line not only when reset is true, but also, so I reset is true R, and the R in C sharp is the double vertical bar. So, double vertical bar on the German keyboard, it should be uh, next to the uh, left shift key. Okay, so if I reset is true, or if my mesh growth system equal equal noon. Okay, so at the beginning it's noon, so if it's noon, then we're gonna initialize it. Okay. This will avoid us from having to hit reset every time when we open the file. Okay, anyway, um, we're not going to test that because um, it's kind of very trivial and you will know uh, what it looks like anyway, so. All right, so um, let's go back to the, the mesh grow system class, okay? So let's recap, we have an update functions that initialize the empty list of uh, total waste move, fill them with zero vector, fill them with waste, okay? And then we do the process collision part where it will start to contribute the move away vector to each of the total weights for each of the vertex, okay? And then after we have all of the total weights and the total total weighted move and the total weights of the total count, we, uh, we uh, update the, actually update the position, okay? So, so far, we only feel the total weight move with the sphere collision move uh, kind of vector. Now we can we can have other kind of mechanism. So we can have another part here that also go in and based on the current position of all the vertex, decide to have other kind of move vector. So, and by other kind, I mean that the move vector that is not caused by the sphere collision, but caused by the edge lamp constraint when they move too far away, or the uh, bending uh, resistance. Uh, yeah, those are the, uh, and what's the other mechanism? Or oh, the S-splitting, okay? But the S-splitting is more interesting, so we're gonna do that first. So we're gonna do the this phase split. Um, let me look at this. Okay, so we do the phase split actually before we compute the move vector. Okay, so at the update, at a, at a very early one, before we go in and, and, and compute the move vector for vertex, we, we're we gonna decide whether we should split the existing edge into two, okay? So we're gonna do the splitting right here, but again, I don't, uh, we're, not, we're not going to directly write the code there, so we're gonna just make a function. So this function is going, um, First, let's declare the function first, okay? So I will collapse update and declare the functions. It's private, it doesn't return anything, and let's say split all long edges. So 
split on long edges. Okay, and the body is empty for now. Okay, now we have to invoke this function, right? So let's expand update again. Go back to update at the beginning. We will call split on long edge, obviously. But I will put in extra things. So the grow, the grow here. So we only perform the splitting if the user set grow, set the grow value to true. Okay, so this is, again, just allow the user an extra mechanism or an extra button to temporarily pause the uh, the splitting okay and if, if the splitting is paused only that is paused but the the sphere relaxation and all the kind of force and, and the moving the moving part I mean is still being executed okay so we only do that if grow is true so if bracket grow close bracket then split on long edges okay All right, and, and the actual value of grow, grow is just a variable now, but the actual value true and false will come from outside, right? Where does it come from? So let's switch it back to our component, the, the, the component called GSC mesh growth. Okay, so it came from iGrow, okay? So we just need to forward iGrow into the my mesh growth system, okay? So my mesh growth system dot grow equal to iGrow, okay? In fact, we will eventually forward all of this input parameter to my MySQL system, so you know my MySQL system can see the value uh, to do the math. Anyway, now let's get back. Now we can start to focus on the real like mesh splitting logic. Okay, so let's go to the definition of split on long edges. Okay, so go to definitions or basically just scroll down. All right. So this part of code where is where we go into modify PT mesh. Okay. So first we need a way to visit all of the edge, systematically visit all of the edge in PT mesh and check for the length. And if the length is above a certain threshold, we going to uh, split the mesh, okay, or modify the mesh by adding new vertex and two new faces. Every time you split, you have like one new edge and two new faces. Okay. So so the so the split on long edge, uh, we rely on, on on a utility function that I write here. This part is actually the logic is slightly tricky because you uh, it, it kind of dive into the logic of a half edge mesh a little bit. But what does this function does is it take in the index of the edge that you want to split, okay? And after this function finish, the mesh, the edge of that particular index will be split into two and also the two flanking phase will be split, split into two, okay? so. I will go into the, 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 the logic later, but for now, just treat it as a black box, okay? We just need to use the split edge to actually split the edge that we want, okay? So the split on, on long edge, we will apply the split edge function to all of the long edge, okay? So first, let's visit all of the edge, and then if they're long, then we are gonna apply the split edge function that I prepare for you down here, okay? So let's uncomment the split edge, and there's a slight mistake here that we're gonna fix together. Um, so, uncomment, uncomment, okay. Okay, and let me, um, so now all of the word mesh, so this should be PT mesh, not mesh. I uh, use a name wrong, a name, a wrong naming conventions, so, but we can mesh replace this by, okay, so this is a nice mesh replace uh, feature, it's, it's actually identical to Microsoft Word, but let's select this block of code, select this block of code, okay. Press Control F to do to go to to activate the shirt and replace. Okay. All right. So so we only want to replace the selection, the current selection. Okay, not the entire file. Okay. Let's expand this this button. Expand this, and we want to say re replace mesh. Okay, it will locate onto the mesh and replace it with PT mesh. Okay.
Control. Control F. Oh, depends on which starting file you want. If you use a day two handout, you start from that. Oh, the day three is correct. Yeah. Okay. Because yesterday I go home and I uh, make some changes, <laughs> so <laughs> to make the naming more consistent. You know. Okay, so again, this is just a utility function. Just treat it as a black box for now, okay? So you, again, a, a function is something that you don't need to know what's going on inside in order to use it. You just need to know what kind of thing it takes and what kind of output it sent out, okay? So I just collapsed it. All right, now focus on split on edge. How do we visit it, it edge uh, of the half edge uh, mesh data structure? So as I told you previously, uh, each edge consists of actually a pair of half edge, and they always go together. So zero, one, two, three. Okay. So we can visit on edge by just visit the odd half uh, or the even half edge. Okay. So we have a for loop that starts from zero and jump by two every time the loop runs. Okay. And that's how we can visit on of the edge systematically. Okay. So let's have. Okay, so let's read out all of the uh, um, uh, the half edge count. So p mesh dot half edges dot count. Okay, and I will save this in, into a shorter name variable. So I will just say int half edge count. Okay. Right now, I have a for loop, and this time I will use um, yeah, so in the code, in the reference code, I use the uh, counter k, but you can use i somewhere, but let's use k for now, so that it looks similar to the reference code. So in k equal to zero, k less than half edge counts, obviously, and but this time k will jump by two every time, so it's either plus plus and then plus plus again. Actually, it's not happy, so we have to do the bracket. Still not happy, really? Okay, or k equal to itself plus two. This is okay. So each time k should jump by jump by two. Okay. Okay. So if that half edge. K happen to be too long, then we call split edge. Okay, we're gonna invoke this function split edge here and pass in the index k, and it will do the splitting for us. Okay, so the actual like hardcore part, like the more the, the kind of uh, more tricky part to wrap your head around is going on here. But I will briefly explain the logic later. Okay, for now we just like forget about that uh, black box. Okay, so um, first we only we have the if uh, have an if statement. So we only invoke this, we only actually split this thing if the number of vertices that we have now is not more than the max vertex count, okay? Because the max vertex count is like the total budget, the, 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 the safe count that we put, otherwise this thing will grow indefinitely and you, know, you will be run out of memory, okay? Or if we run like really slow. So if mesh, if pt mesh dot vertices dot count less than max vertex count, okay? Hmm, max vertex count is not being recognized here. Uh, max vertex count, strange, you know. Okay, so that is the first condition, and the second condition is that the edge has to be long enough. Okay, so we say n end. Okay, that's how you do n in C sharp. So if we still can, we still haven't reached the maximum and the the length. So 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 to compute the length is very simple. So uh, pt mesh dot have edges dot get length, okay, and the get length is a function that's taking the index of the half edge that you want to query, so it's going to be k, right? All right. It's a pretty long line, so I'm gonna break the line. So after the end, I just 
press enter to break the line. Okay. So if the length is less or, or sorry more than the splitting threshold. Okay. So what is is the splitting threshold? The splitting threshold. Rather than making it a, a specific value, I gotta make it a percentage of the collision distance. So I gotta say 99%, so 0.99 times the collision distance. Okay. So if it almost like reached the collision distance, it will split. Okay. All right. If this okay, so if those two conditions is true, then. Um, Okay, I open the curly bracket here because it makes it slightly easier to read. Curly bracket, okay. Um, split edge K. Okay, and that edge will be split and the two flanking face will be also split into into uh, two half. Okay. And the, uh, so, so when we add, so we split an edge, the new vertex will pop up right in the middle. So the code that I do below, which I will explain um, probably a bit later, or maybe in the afternoon uh, after we get the, everything for running. So this one will place the new vertex at the midpoint of the of, of the uh, two end of the edge that we are splitting. Okay, so it's, we almost ready to test it. It's it's um, almost done, except that. Uh, the max vertex count, we again, we have to pass it in, okay? So the max vertex count is being used in that if statement, but like um, it's being zero for now, if the default value is zero, so we have to read it out, read it from, from here and pass it in, so. No, if you have. No, so if you look at every triangle, if you decide to split it one, yeah. then this, then this, you will have two new edge here as well. Ah, uh, so you're not splitting the other two edges. You're, you're uh, what is the other two? Or you just so if I split it one, yeah. and it will create like a new, uh, two new. Two new, but that's two new will. Uh, two this two. New but, one yeah. yeah. Okay, that's it. Okay, so max. Okay, so by now you realize that we're gonna eventually pass all of this in, right? Uh, so let, let's do it all for now and forget about all of this like boring parameter passing, okay? So we're passing grow, max vertex count, collision distance. We, okay, so we're gonna grow, max vertex count, collision distance. Okay, we have to pass in the edge length constraint as well. We're not, we, ha we haven't used it yet, but we just pass it in, so we don't have to worry about this step anymore. dot i h With auto complete, you should be able to, to uh, finish quite uh, comfortably. Mm Okay, now let's test this. 
build and run and you should see the um, mesh splitting uh, but make sure that the grow button is set to true okay if it's false then it will not split okay so grow is being false now so no splitting set to true and it should start splitting like crazy and you can temporarily turn it off uh, so that to allow it more time to relax before you turn grow back on again Okay, so raise your hand if you need my help. Okay, let's carry on. Um, um, what is the next feature? Okay, the next one we're going to do is um, the edge lane constraint um, that basically try to pull them back. Uh, you know what? Actually, that one is we can do that later because this one is, doesn't have a lot of visual impact. Um, we're gonna do the bending resistance first. This one actually has more, more impact and um, kind of also more interesting to do overall. So, okay, let's prepare the, uh, the template code first and then we can, uh, I look, we can look at the logic. So, process collisions, okay, so just Below process collision, again, we're going to have another function called process bending resistant, okay? So, process bending resistant, okay, we haven't defined it yet, so there will be no autocomplete and there will be an error message. Uh, bending resistance. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, just another feature of Visual Studio. If you happen to say a function that does not exist, if you click on the, um, if you like hover the mouse over that, you either see a light bulb underneath it or on the margin. If you click on the light bulb, it will suggest you a few idea. If 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 if, if we can find a function that has a closely a similar name, then it will say, "Did you actually mean this function?" Otherwise, it will say, "Okay." We, we can help you generate uh, this function from scratch. Okay, just the basic part of it. Not It's not going to write the, uh, the code for you. So if I, I can generate this, and then it will just make a private void function right here for you automatically. And this line of code, we can just safely delete it. Okay. All right, now let's look at the logic. Um, so the bending stiffness is we go through each pair of triangles. And how do we visit each pair of triangles? Well, visiting each pair of triangle is equivalent to visit each pair of edge, okay? We visit each edge of, uh, of edge in the mesh. If the edge happens to be naked, naked means it's at the border, then we skip, we don't, we don't consider that one because there's no pair of triangle, right? But if the edge is like a normal internal edge like this, okay, then we can easily query the uh, two triangles using the half edge mesh uh, kind of data structure. Uh, we're gonna show you in a minute, but let's say that we already know that we are, let's say that we're currently looking at this pair of uh, triangular faces how do we create the move vector that try to make them move in such a way that they will end up being planar, okay? 
So this is not a fully physically correct simulation of like how bending work in physical material. This is just like a geometric approximation of you know points and line, but it will give you like a pretty um, decent approximation of like uh, what's going on in real life. Okay, but in real life, of course, the, um, um, the the bending resistance depends really on the um, material uh, properties. Okay, and so metal bends very, for example, very uh, differently from kale leaf, for example. So how do we um, work out the move vector for each of the vertex? Okay, so for the pair of triangles, we work out the move vector for those two, but for for this one, we have to work out the move vector for four vertices. Okay, and again, this move vector will somehow be combined or average with the move vector from the sphere collision. Remember, all of this is about working out the move vector, combine them up or taking the average and move them, and they will, you know move to the next position and then we repeat the exact same process again and they will eventually move to a, a position where 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 all of these seemingly conflicting move vector reach the best compromise. Okay, so um, all right, so look at the side view of the pair of triangle. Uh, first in order to know where to move them, we have to work out what is the plan, the common plan that they should move to. Okay, so if they all move this common plan um, or this common target plan, uh, they will become flattened, right? Okay, so what does this target plan look like? Okay, visually they, they look like this, but how do we compute them in a meaningful way? So let's say that we are already using the half edge match to obtain the four vertex, the four pawn 3D, okay? How, how, how do we get this plan from the pawn 3D? Okay, a plan in 3D space is defined by the origin and the vector, the normal vector, right? Now the origin is super easy. Uh, Probably it's not like fully convincing, but a natural choice is the origins gonna be just the average of these four points. Okay, uh, that's a sensible choice. In fact, it's actually um, a physically correct choice as well. Um, and then the vector. How about the vector here? The vector here is going to be the vector of this phase, average with the vector of that phase. Okay. Also, a very like kind of natural choice because if you average the two, then you end up with a red vector that points more or less in the shared direction or average directions. Um, however, uh, what we do is that we don't. In this case, if we just like simply compute the normal vector whose um, of length one and add them up, then the red the, 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 the red vector will point directly in the middle of the two normal vector, right? However, we want to be a little bit fairer to the triangles here in the sense that if this triangle is like much larger or longer, we should give this normal vector more influence toward the final vector, okay? So, um, because our mesh is not uniform, some triangles is larger than the other one, so we want to take the average vector so that it's point more toward this, the larger phase, okay? Rather than completely in the middle. This will give the target plan a more kind of natural orientation, okay? And um, and the final shape will somehow be a bit smoother. Okay, so, but that is easy uh, because when we compute the normal vector, we're gonna use the cross product, and the cross product will give us. Okay, this is high school math now. In case you, are, I have to remind you. So we take the cross product of this vector and this vector, and we will get the vector pointing, you know, perpendicular to the uh, screen, and the length of that vector is going to be twice the triangle of this area. Okay. So we will end up with a normal vector pointing this way, but this one will be very short because the area is short, and this one, the normal vector will be longer. And when you add them up, you will end up with with a direction that's point towards the longer one. So, so um, you naturally have that kind of bias automatically. Okay, it just compute the normal vector using the cross product, but we do not normalize them because we want to keep the, the, the length. Okay, so the smaller the triangle, the normal vector will be shorter. The larger the triangle, the longer its normal vector will be. And when we do the averaging, we will get like a much better representation uh, representative of what the target plan orientation should look like. Okay, so that's part. Um, it hopefully, it's clear. Okay, but even if you just take the average, just like compute the normal vector and take the average, you still get the um, fairly good result. Okay. All right. So the only question left is so here we assume that we already know the points uh, 3D, right? But first we have to figure out how to obtain it. Okay. So in other words, we're gonna visit each edge k. We did it in the split edge uh, procedure, right? We we have a for loop that visit each edge k, 
and the neighbor one is just k plus one, right? Uh, not the neighbor, but the sibling at the sibling half at is just k plus one. Now the goal is by looking at k, we have to retrieve the index. We have to retrieve the index i j, p and q. Okay, and then if we have the index of the vertex, we can retrieve the actual point three D to do the math. Okay, so how do we retrieve uh, i, j, p and q? Okay, so if you are at half at k, then you can say half at k dot start vertex because this is how half edge, half edge uh, mesh data structure works. It half edge has explicit knowledge about the index of the star vertex. Okay, so I is easy. How about J? Well, J is going to be... There's two ways to obtain J. J is going to be the star vertex of the next half edge in the cycle, or it's going to be the star vertex of the sibling edge. Okay, so for J... Uh, we, we're going to type this code in later, I just so I want to explain the math a little bit. Uh, not the math, but like the um, the topology lo uh, logic a little bit. So to get J, we have to look at the sibling vertex, okay? Which is basically half at K plus one dot star vertex. Okay, so again, really trivial, okay? If you do it with normal Rhino mesh, it's actually not this as elegant as using like the, the Blanton mesh like this, for example. Um, I... There's a typo here. It should be PT mesh. Let me fix it quickly. PT. Is there also n vertex? So the n vertex is found by indirectly looking at the sibling one. Okay. So it's not explicitly star, but you can easily get that by by add one or minus one, depend right. So if 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 k is an odd, you should minus. But if k is even, you should plus one to find the sibling one. Okay. So that's trivial. Uh, Okay, P, P is going to be the start vertex of the previous half edge compared to K, right? So from K, we query the index of the previous half edge, okay? So half edge K dot previous half edge, so this whole thing will be the index of the previous half edge, right? So we feed that index into the list of half edge, okay? And this whole thing gonna be gonna be the uh, previous uh, previous half edge and this is the start vertex okay so p is going to be the start vertex of the previous half edge uh, for those of you who have never programmed before uh, or not, not programmed like also new to like this kind of programming and you this is probably the first time you see we have an index here which basically return another index so that's why we have a square bracket within the square bracket okay so this thing will give us the index of the half edge but we have to use that to look into the to the list of half edge to find the real thing Okay, and Q is going to be what? Um, Q, Q is similar. Q is just the um, the start vertex of the previous half edge of K plus one. Okay, so so again with um, plankton mesh, it's very easy to work out the topology. If you try to find the neighbors in the classic Rhino mesh, it's still possible. It's just it's not like clean. You have to do the if statement uh, to check if. Because if you look at the face, it just return three vertex in rather arbitrary order, and you have to compare with you know your current vertex to work out the neighbor one. So it, it's it's not as elegant and clean as a, as a plankton mesh, for example. All right. So so this together with this is like basically how the algorithm works. Okay. So uh, we work out a plan. After we have the plan, we just simply move. The move vector is basically from where we are to to the plan, right? Okay. So let's go to process bending resistance. Okay, so read out the half edge count. Uh, so int half edge count equal to pt mesh dot half edges dot count. Okay. And now we're gonna visit it half edge. So for int i equal to uh, we use k because i and j and p and q are used to describe the vertex index. So we use k to describe the um, half edge index. K k less than um, half edge count obviously. K plus equal to two. Okay. All right, index i is going to be pt mesh dot half edges k
okay and um, the, so that is the i the, the index i for the uh, starting vertex the j is going to be similar so i copy and paste i will say j and i change k from k plus 1 okay so in j Ah, so that was it. Okay, plus one. Okay, so next is P, okay, so this is a bit long, so P equal to PT mesh, half edge, okay, okay, and inside is the, the index of the previous, and the previous is going to be PT mesh dot half edge, K dot previous, prev half edge, okay, dot star vertex at the end. And Q. Okay, so Q is gonna be almost the same. So I copy and paste. Okay, plus one. Previous. No, it's fine. Otherwise, I will have a red weekly lines. Uh, Okay, I know this. If this is the first time you see this kind of uh, grammar, it might feel like speaking Japanese or Korean, where the subject and the verb <laughs> phrase kind of come in a, a very nonlinear order. <laughs> Okay, so that's the index. Now we need to obtain the actual point. Okay, so PT mesh dot vertices at position I. Okay, and convert it to point 3D. To point 3D. Okay, and we save this point as a variable of type point 3D, and we call it V capital I. Okay, so vertex I. Okay, and we do the same for vertex uh, J, P, and Q. Okay. So, so copy this. Okay, now we can compute the plane origin and, and the uh, normal vector of the uh, common target plane, right? Um, the origin is easy, just average uh, VI, VJ, VP, and VQ. Uh, now, but let's do the normal first. So let's compute the normal of the left face, okay? The face that um, has the, the VP tip. And then we compute the normal of the triangular face that has the VQ tip. Okay, so vector 3D and capital P, so the normal for the face that has the P tip, okay? is going to be the cross product of the vector. Okay, so let me put out the diagram again. So it's going to be the cross product of the vector going from I to J with the vector going from I to P. Okay, that will give us the uh, normal vector. So, so uh, to do the cross product, 
So we're going to use the function vector 3 d dot cross product. So it's, it's a, a static function. Well, we haven't talked about static function yet, but it's a function com that is associated with a data type, a vector 3 d. So that's why we say the, the, the data type name and then the function name. Okay, this function we take in two vector 3 d. Okay, the first vector we can obtain by subtract vj minus vi. Okay, so that's going to be a vector going from i to j. So vj, vj minus vi. That's the first vector. The second vector is going to be VP minus VI. Okay, so remember the cross product will give us a vector that points in the normal direction, but the length of the vector will be twice the area of the triangle JIP. The triangle that's made up the three vertex JIP. All right, we do the same thing for the other normal vector. So I will copy and paste. And there's two places you need to change, NQ and VQ, OK? Okay, now we can s s uh, add those two vectors together to get the actual uh, average vector uh, for a normal plane. So, vector 3D dot plane normal will be just NP plus NQ, okay? And then we normally, uh, if we uh, uh, um, the normal vector has uh, length one, so we usually scale it back to length one by unitize it, but we don't need to because when we pass this to the constructor of the rhino plane geometry, uh, the, the rhino plane constructor will automatically unitize it, so we don't need to manually unitize the, the normal. We just leave it at that, that it at ease. Okay, now the the, the plane origin. So point three plane origin. This is gonna be the sum of this four vertex divided by four, so I would say 0 0.25 times bracket vi plus vj plus vp plus vq, okay? Now let's compute the uh, let's build the target plan. Um, so plan with capital P. So this is the data type plan, and the, the variable name gonna be lowercase plan. Okay, and then it's gonna be new plan. Okay, where we supply the plan origins and the plan normal. Okay, so now let's compute uh, the vector that move vi. Okay, so vi is supposed to move to, to so, so the move vector for vertex i is basically a vector going from the vi to, to its projection on the plan, right? Okay, so let's compute that vector first. So plan dot closest point vi. Okay, so, so this function will return the closest point of vi on the plan, which is the projection. So that's where we are supposed to, but we not we are going to describe the, the movement vector, not the final destination. So we have to subtract it from vi, and this will give us the vector that it should move. Okay.
and we add this vector to the total wave move, total wasted move of vertex i. Okay, so it's similar to how we do this field collision, but this time we the move vector is computed differently. But at the end of the day, we come, we add it to to the total wave move of vertex i. That's I. You, we have to do the same for J, P, and Q. We have to move far up the vertex to the plane, okay? So copy, paste, and change it to J, P, Q, and J, P, Q. Okay, and because we just add a new move contribution to uh, the vertex, we also have to increase the count or the, the total count or the total weight by one, okay? Total weight of I plus equal 1.0, and same for the other three vertices. And then we want to compute the average. And average means that you have to, to add them up and divide by the total count, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to keep track of the total count. If we if you don't add now, there's no way you can tell later how many vector that has has been contribute to, to each vertex i. So that's why we have to manually keep track of it using total weights i, total weights j, and total weights p. Okay, now we can build and run. And now you, um, you will say see some minor bending resistance um, um, effect kicking in, where this thing will not be as like foldy or like um, curvy uh, as this be. It should be try to be flatter. So um, if you run this without adding new vertex or turn crow to form, you will see they will try to flatten out. They will try to become like planar. Okay. So this kind of proof that the effects does have like uh, is being active. All right. Um, if you need my help. Okay. How's it behaving now? 
looking really fast. It actually doesn't also to grow really fast. Yeah, if I but also try to flatten the core, you see, this one is like more planar than the core. Okay, so okay, no. So that's okay. Yeah. Give it a very small button. Uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay. So it's trying to be black, is it? Yes. 